Refurbishing a vintage model steamboat, this is part 3, and it's called Essential Steam Engine Modifications. As I've mentioned previously, this engine was built by a friend of mine, the late Bernard Walker, and it was built as a display model. Bernard Walker had quite a collection of steam engines, and he used to run them mainly at exhibitions. He would run them on compressed air normally, hence there are no connectors fitted. This engine would have been fed with compressed air via a plastic pipe just pushed onto the inlet manifold. This situation is no good at all in a model steamboat. What I'm doing at the moment is fitting a couple of lock nuts in place of the clamp nut that would normally be used to hold the valve gear in position because I need this to be radio controlled. Later on in the episode I'll show how I do this. All I'm doing at the moment is putting a couple of lock nuts on to replace the knurled wheel that would normally tighten the shaft. I'm leaving the support rod in place just for a bit of extra strength, although with radio control this is not really required. In this clip I'm just making sure that it's not too slack and not too tight. Over now to fitting the inlet and exhaust unions. You can clearly see what I've done here. I've silver soldered a cone nipple on the end of each pipe. One is three sixteenths of an inch and the other one is a quarter pipe. By only having the need to silver solder the coned unions, I didn't need to use too much heat, just enough to get the ends of the pipes red. And this meant that I didn't have to dismantle the engine to fit them. And it's always good to save a little time, it's something we're all running out of rapidly. Time now to have a look at the transmission. These are model universal joints and they're commercially available at most model shops. And they come complete with various sizes of brass fittings. And these are splined to fit into the plastic part, or the nylon part, or whatever it's made out of. I've always found these to be very reliable. I did have to modify this fitting. I bored it out to fit on the end of the crankshaft. But the problem is, this crankshaft is far too long. It's very tight in this boat, so I'm going to have to shorten the crankshaft. I'm sure there are many Stuart Models purists out there who are going to cringe at what I'm about to do. But I have to shorten this crankshaft. I'm not going to video it because I think it may be too much for some people. Suffice to say that I shortened the crankshaft until it looked like this. I now can successfully fit this brass fitting without it sticking out too far. And all I have to do now is tighten the grub screw with an allen key. And now it's time for a test run. Yes, it runs well. It runs in both directions quite smoothly. I have received a message from a viewer and the viewer writes, so is there no condenser between the engine exhaust and the chimney? Does that mean the boat won't actually be used on the water? And my answer to that is, <laughs> I'm really sorry. I do try. I do try. Yes, of course, there's going to be a condenser. But for now, I'm showing other things. This one is all about the engine not about the exhaust condenser that will be fitted later on in the series. If you look on my gallery page on the Mainsteam website, that's www.mainsteam.co.uk as it shows on screen, you will see that I've built quite a lot of steam plants over the years. This is the arrangement I would use to operate the control arm on a steam engine that reverses using Stevenson's link motion. All it is is a simple bell crank with one arm longer than the other, and the longer arm links to the lever with either a piece of wire or a suitable radio control clevis, the type that just snapped together. But obviously, I wouldn't use the plastic ones, I would use the metal ones. And in order to make this work, I have to make a simple fitting. I'm not going to bother going through the lathe operations. It's a piece of brass with a hole drilled down the middle. The hole in the piece of brass has to match the size of the arm. And here, I'm just marking off for the length. And I put it back in the lathe and cut it off to this length, because I don't want too much sticking out, otherwise the leverage will be a problem. What I then do is put it in the milling machine and quickly mill a flat on each side. Here I'm cleaning this up with a small needle file. It's always best to do a bit of cleaning up and polishing, I don't like to leave things in a rough condition, other than maybe a girlfriend I used to have many years ago, but that's another story. The suitably cleaned up arm now can be fastened to the handle, using some Loctite 638. The good thing about doing it this way is I'm not making any modifications to the engine really, I'm not drilling any holes in the engine or machining any bits of it. All I'm doing is Loctite in this piece of brass over the existing handle. And if ever I want to remove it, all I have to do is warm it up with a blow lamp and that will cause the Loctite to lose its grip and the part can be withdrawn. 
I'm just checking that it's square by just putting a spanner on the end of it. It's easier to see. Yes, it's fine. This feels pretty good. It's very smooth in every direction. No tight spots anywhere, which is what you need. Because any tight spots in the radio control side of the system will cause excessive load on the battery and may cause premature draining of the battery, which with radio control is not a good thing. Here you see the option that I've got with the fittings. This is a radio control clevis, and this is a piece of wire. It depends how it works out in the end. I'm not sure which I'm going to use yet. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.